We're doing a survey of the Old Testament, and we're up to the book of Proverbs. It's still part of the wisdom literature. Uh, how many of you like the book of Proverbs? Even as a kid, I've always enjoyed this book, uh, and Proverbs in general. It's just a, a neat way to encap encapsulate wisdom, which we've talked about some, we'll talk about some more today. Um, this is a quote from uh, Roy Zook. It's on the doctrine of wisdom. He says, as stated earlier, wisdom means being skillful and successful in one's relationships and responsibilities. That's what biblical wisdom is about. It's really living successfully, biblically defined. It involves observing and following the Creator's principles of order in the moral universe. The idea there is that God has built wisdom into the fabric of His creation. <coughs> And what the wisdom teachers sought to do was study and observe life and try to figure out what the best way to negotiate life is. What's the best way to make decisions? What's the best way to accomplish justice? This order that God's created manifests God's wisdom, which is available to man. Certainly God hasn't revealed everything to us, but what he has revealed to us, we should certainly take advantage of. So to the extent man follows this order, he's wise. Heeding the wisdom of the book of Proverbs then brings harmony to one's life. Now, that doesn't mean that life is just a bed of roses, that you're never going to have trouble. What wisdom means is that you know how to deal with trouble. You know how to trust the Lord. You know how to fear the Lord. You know how to uh, have peace in the midst of trouble. By contrast, failure to heed God's divine design results in disorder, lack of compliance when God's wise ways brings unpleasant and disastrous consequences. Now, again, there's exceptions to that. There's exceptions to Proverbs, but the book of Proverbs doesn't deal with the exceptions. It deals with the way things generally work. We know from Scripture itself that there are times, for example, that the wicked prosper. They don't follow God's wisdom, and yet they have... Uh, materially prosperous lives. They, they don't lack for money or food or those kinds of things. But ultimately, uh, sometimes you have to look at the broader view. You have to recognize that in God's wisdom, in the end, wisdom will be vindicated and wickedness will not. Nature of Proverbs, uh, Benware says that a proverb is a brief saying that's used to communicate much truth. In a concise, striking way, truth is expressed as to be caught by the mind and retained by the memory. Can you give me an example of a proverb that you know that isn't a biblical proverb, but just one that kind of that you've learned from either living here or living in another part of the world? This comes out of a wisdom tradition that's all over the world. People in every culture have proverbs. The early bird gets the worm. The early bird gets the worm. And what is that? Reflect. <coughs> Diligence and initiative. And, and not sleeping late. And either. not sleeping late. Yeah, I mean, because that is a wrecking. Uh, diligence involves getting up in a, at a good time in the morning and working hard rather than just laying in your bed. Now, Proverbs talks about that too, but that's a good example of a proverb outside of the Bible. You might give me another one. White Re people in Russia, if you look alike, they'll say you're like two drops of water. Okay, like. like Two drops of water. What would be an American version of that? Chip off the old block. Chip off the old block? Like father, like father, like son. Two peas in a pod would be another one. So these are things that we do kind of automatically, but you know, we're setting the wisdom of Proverbs in the Bible apart from those kinds of sayings. They really arrived at it the same way. In both cases, <laughs> you're looking at life and you're coming up with a saying that encapsulates the truth. And again, these are observations in life that are generally true. They're not to be taken as ironclad promises. Uh, Proverbs is dealing with the, things, the way things generally work. Job and Ecclesiastes are the ones that deal with the exceptions. You remember, Job's counselors assumed that Job had sinned and that he was getting repaid for his sin, and they wanted him to fess up. That was what was driving their counsel to him. Look. We know you've done something to deserve all this trouble that God has brought upon you. Why don't you just confess? And Job says, 
And I don't think Job is saying that he wasn't in any way a sinner, that he was absolutely righteous. He said, I've not done anything that fits or merits this kind of punishment. And in the end, you know, God said that Job was right. He spoke what was right about God, and the three friends had not. But they were, they were operating on a premise that God punishes wickedness and rewards righteousness. And that's true in general, but there are exceptions to that. Proverbs is really similar to the Psalms that we talked about last week in the sense of there were various collections made at different times through Israel's history, and then ultimately they were put together in one collection. The major contributor, of course, is King Solomon. Uh, he reigned from 971 to 931 B.C. Other contributors include a man named Augur and King Lemuel. They're at the very end of the Proverbs. We know virtually nothing else about them. Uh, we don't think that they were Isra Israelite, that they were Israelites. Uh, so uh, that's another example of the fact that there were wisdom traditions outside of the Bible. But God, again, like he did with the covenants, used a format that everybody was familiar with as he inspired Solomon to write and collect these sayings. There's also a number of anonymous sayings in Proverbs. We don't know who wrote them, just like we don't know a lot of the Proverbs the origin of some of the Proverbs that we quoted. The final edition of this book appears to have been compiled in the days of Hezekiah in approximately 690 B.C. So let's, let's think about Solomon. Uh, to me, he's one of the most fascinating characters in Scripture, and I want us to read a little bit about him and some background on him. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 3 through 14 helps us understand uh, part of him, and we'll look at these other scriptures as well. 1 Kings 3, beginning in verse 3. Who was Solomon, by the way? Who was, who was his father? David. 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 Remember, David had wanted, or had wanted to build a temple for the Lord, and the Lord said, no, you're not to be the one to do this, through the prophet Nathan, and Solomon ended up being the one that built it. Verse 3 of 1 Kings 3 says, now Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask what you wish me to give you. Now, that is quite a... Uh, <clears throat> unusual incident right there the Lord God himself asking a, a man virtually whatever you want ask and I'll give it to you then Solomon said thou hast shown great loving kindness to thy servant David my father according as he has walked before thee in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart toward thee and thou hast reserved for him this great loving kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne he's talking about himself there as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king in place of my father David, yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Now he wasn't literally a young child at this point, but he recognized his own need for wisdom here. He recognized that he still had a lot to learn, especially about being a king. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen a great people who cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. Now here's where he gives the request that he's asking of God. So give thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, to discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of thine? Now he probably, I don't think there's any way he could have asked for something better than that. And, and the Lord's going to reward him accordingly. He demonstrates that he already had a certain measure of wisdom. He certainly demonstrates his fear of the Lord here in this passage, his love for the Lord. Uh, the writer says that he loved the Lord. But he also demonstrated that he needed wisdom, and that's what God's going to give him. But because he's going to get wisdom, he's going to get a lot of other stuff in addition to that. And that's kind of the way wisdom works. That's the way Proverbs describes it. It talks about the great value of wisdom because that helps you in other areas. Verse 10, it was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing, and God said to him, Because you have asked this thing, 
and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies. And again, a lot of kings would have done that, right? They would have wanted to conquer their enemies. They would have wanted great wealth. But have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Another thing that Solomon did here, he was asking for wisdom, not just for himself personally, but that he might judge Israel properly. And, and God's rewarding him for that. Behold, I've done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart so that there has been no one like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. Again, that's quite a statement. He's basically saying, Solomon is the wisest man ever to walk the earth, obvious exception being the Lord Jesus himself. I've also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. And if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and commandments, as your father David walked, then I will prolong your days. That's a reference to the Davidic covenant there. Um, but the main point here is that when Solomon had the opportunity to ask anything that he wanted of the Lord, he asked for the best thing he could have received, and that was wisdom. Now, right after this incident, uh, there's a story about these two prostitutes, both of which had children, uh, one of which died in the night, and there was a dispute over the living baby as to who it belonged to. And what was Solomon's advice to determine who the baby was? Elsie? The baby in half. Cut the baby in half and, and give it to both women. And what was the ladies, the two ladies' responses? What did the true mother said, say? Yeah, um, cut it in half. Okay. And so from that, Solomon, I mean, he, he was the one who proposed this test in the first place. He knew who the true mother was. It was the one that wanted to preserve the life of the child, even at the cost of giving it up to the other lady. That was an example of the kind of wisdom that God gave. And, and that was what a king was supposed to do, was to decide on these kinds of matters uh, amongst the people of Israel. And the concluding statement there in verse 28 is helpful to read. When all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had handed down, they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. So that gives us some good background on how Solomon got the wisdom that, that he eventually used to write these Proverbs. I want to read a couple of other passages that speak about this as well. If we look in 1 Kings 4, in the, in the next chapter, verses 29 through 34, it says, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great discernment and breadth of mind like the sand that is on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the sons of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan, the Ezrahite, Haman, Kalkal, and Darda, the sons of Mahol, and his fame was known in all the surrounding nations. So again, there was this wisdom tradition that existed all over the world, and Solomon, given this special wisdom by God, was being exalted above all of the others. He also spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. We have two of those songs recorded for us in Scripture. One is a psalm, and one is the song of songs, the ultimate song, which was Solomon's. That means it's the very best song. He spoke of trees from the cedar that's in Lebanon, even to the hyssop that grows on the wall. He spoke also of animals and birds and creeping things and fish. And men came from all peoples to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. So it gives you an idea that Solomon wasn't just wise in spiritual matters. He knew about all kinds of things. And of course, all the things that he knew about in creation were ultimately things that he was uh, learning and knowing that reflected back on the character of God. But he was just one smart cat. He was very, very wise because God had given him that wisdom. And then one more passage, just as background to Solomon. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9. In addition to being a wise man, the preacher, as he's called in Ecclesiastes, also taught the people knowledge. And he pondered, searched out, and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth 
correctly. Part of what wisdom teaching does is not only um, get the truth right, get wisdom right, but try to present it in such a way that it's retained in the memory and that people want to employ it in their own lives. The, the words of wise men are like goads, and the masters of these collections are like well-driven nails or pegs. He's talking about the equipment of a shepherd there. A goad is a sharp pointed stick that a shepherd would use to guide the sheep and kind of get them to go where he wanted them to go. A peg he would use to leash the sheep to a certain area. And so Proverbs helps do that in our lives. They, they guide us, they stimulate us to action. They also help us to restrain from action that's sinful or wrong. They're given by one shepherd. All right, so that's some background on Solomon. Uh, he was the king at the height of Israel's glory. He was the wisest man of all time. The sad thing is that he ultimately uh, did the very three things that that's, the Lord said that the king shouldn't do. He multiplied many foreign wives. He multiplied silver and he multiplied horses. And it led to his downfall as a king. Isaiah? Didn't God give him all the gold and horses? He, he did, uh, but what, what he had warned about for the kings back in Deuteronomy 17, even though those things were out there and available, that they were not to depend on those. And the, the thing with the foreign wives was that they would lead you away from the Lord. They worshiped other gods. And in fact, that's what, that's what happened to Solomon. His heart was turned away from the Lord. So even though those things are out there, you could say that they were... I don't know if it's right to say that in this case they were gifts from God because God actually put a prohibition on, on going after them. And certainly he had plenty of riches and other things himself, but he multiplied them to the point where he depended upon them instead of upon the Lord. And in fact, his wisdom seems to be his downfall. His own wisdom got away from him to the point where, um, well, he, he stopped fearing the Lord. And that's the very beginning of wisdom, as we'll see. Okay, there's a book by a guy named Dan Estes that's really good on the book of Proverbs, particularly the first nine chapters of Proverbs. It's called Hear My Son, Teaching and Learning in Proverbs 1 to 9. And I want to give you four assumptions of Solomon's worldview uh, from that book that I think help us understand what he's trying to do in the book of Proverbs. First, creation. The universe is Yahweh's creation. Because Yahweh created the world in a pur purposeful way, the world is not random and meaningless. And of course, there's a lot of people out there today that would say that it is. That it's, you know, came into being through evolution and that there's nobody controlling the universe. We know better. The order that God established when he made the world provides the ground for human significance in the world. And what we're trying to do in the wisdom literature is to tap in to the order that God has already put there. Order. Yahweh is sovereignly controlling the world. There's a predictable relationship between acts and consequences, which holds true in most situations in life. If you, if you drive too fast and you're on a winding road, it's going to cost you in the end. So you use caution. You don't drive as fast. You use wisdom in that situation. This order encourages the search by wise teachers to regulate life in accordance with the intrinsic order of the universe. That's what wisdom teachers are doing. They're studying life. They're studying creation. They're seeking to understand it for themselves and then to teach it to others. Rationality. Yahweh's world is knowable, but also mysterious. You know, there's a verse in Deuteronomy that says, the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children. So we want to understand the wisdom that God has revealed in his word. Because Yahweh created the world and he's sovereignly controlling it, the world is knowable at least in part. And you know, a lot of what Ecclesiastes is talking about is that search for knowing and understanding what the world is and what it's about and how frustrating that is. I think he's talking about it. It's frustrating because of the curse on the one hand. It's also frustrating because just as we reach an age where we're starting to figure some things out and have wisdom, we die. 
You know, we don't live that long. Life is uh, just a breath. But we still are driven to understand and to live in accordance with the wisdom that God has put into the universe. The universe manifests intelligent design in its order. This fact is the foundation for human understanding in the cosmos. Again, not just about spiritual matters, although there's a lot in Proverbs about that. A lot of Proverbs is applying what the law taught back in the, sun, in the Mosaic Covenant but also just about all of creation. Finally, fear of Yahweh. Humans must reverence Yahweh in their lives. Fear of Yahweh is an implication of his creation of the universe. Because Yahweh alone fashioned the world, because there is only one true God, all of life proceeds from him. Yahweh then is the foundational authority for the whole ethical system of wisdom. Okay. Let's look now at the structure or the outline of the book of Proverbs. This is a book that has a very clear purpose statement for us in its first seven verses. I want to read those. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive. We'll talk about the naive and exactly what that term means. To the youth, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning. A man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. <coughs> to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So he's just laying out there in those first seven verses what he's trying to do in the book of Proverbs. And then we have a section of the remaining of chapter 1 all the way through chapters nine, chapter 9 that gives a father's reflection on the way of wisdom. Some people call this a, a wisdom parent. Uh, there's discourses on wisdom in chapters 1 through 4. There's instructions on marriage in particular and warnings against adultery in chapters 5 through 7. And there's wisdom personified. Both Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly show up in chapters 8 and 9. What I want to do here is just read some sample verses from each one of these sections to give you an idea of, you know, kind of the main theme of what's going on in there. As far as these discourses on wisdom, we, first, we see first the availability of wisdom in chapter 1. Proverbs 1.20 says, Wisdom shouts in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the gates in the city, she utters her sayings. So wisdom's out there. It's available. She's trying to say, here, here I am. Learn from me. Now she's going to have a competing voice, and we're going to learn, see what that is in just a minute. But that's the first point, is that wisdom is available for those that seek it. Secondly, there's great value in seeking wisdom. Proverbs 2.1. My son, if you'll receive my sayings and treasure up my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. Sounds a lot like Job 28 that we looked at already. Just the great value of wisdom and the need to pursue it. Thirdly are the blessings of wisdom. In chapter 3, verse 13, How blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For its profit is better than the profit of silver and its gain than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire compares with her. Finally, the need to pursue wisdom in chapter 4. Hear, O sons, the instruction of a father and give attention that you may gain understanding. For I give you sound teaching. Do not abandon my instruction. So what he's doing in these first four chapters is just trying to motivate the, the learner, the naive person, the one who needs to learn to get wisdom, to see the great value of it, and to pursue it even above riches. We get to chapters 5 through 7. There's instructions on marriage, and especially on avoiding the adulterous woman. Proverbs 5, 8, Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. 
lest you give your vigor to others and your years to the cruel one. He's just talking about the consequences there of getting involved in an adulterous relationship. <clears throat> lest strangers be filled with your strength. And that would be the children that might come out of that relationship. And your hard-earned goods go to the house of an alien. And you groan at your latter end when your flesh and your body are consumed. We have more on avoiding the adulteress. In fact, most of chapter 7 describes the seductive ways of the adulteress. Seven four says, Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your intimate friend, that they may keep you from an adulteress, from the foreigner who flatters with her words. Conversely, we have our, our, the solution that Solomon provides to avoiding the adulteress is to have your own wife. That's the way that God's designed it to be. And he says uh, in Proverbs 5.15, drink water from your own cistern. And again, he's not talking about real water from a, a real well. He's using that metaphorically. Fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be yours alone and not for strangers. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. All right, in chapters 8 and 9, we see wisdom personified. This is a passage that I'm sure you're very familiar with. But it's as if wisdom is talking to us directly, as if she is a person. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. From everlasting, I was established from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth when there were no springs abounding with water. So the idea here is before anything else was created, God created wisdom in a sense. And that wisdom stood by him as he made all the rest of the universe. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While he had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he inscribed a circle in the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when the springs of the deep became fixed, when he set for the sea its boundaries so that the water should not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, there I was beside him as a master workman, <clears throat> and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. So again, that goes back to the idea that wisdom was built into the very fabric of creation itself. Then we have this contrast in chapter 9 between lady, lady Wisdom and Lady Folly. Wisdom has built her house. She's hewn out her seven pillars. She's prepared her food. for She has mixed her wine. She's also set her table. She sent out her maidens. She calls from the tops of the heights of the city. Whoever is naive, let him turn in here. To him who lacks understanding, she says, Come, eat of my food and drink of the wine I have mixed. Forsake your folly and live and proceed in the way of understanding. So that's just a very graphic way of describing the fact that wisdom is available. And she beckons those who need wisdom to come and learn wisdom. On the other hand, Lady Folly, uh, in, in verse 13, the woman of folly is boisterous. She is naive and knows nothing. She sits at the doorway of her house on a seat by the high places of the city, calling to those who pass by, who are making their path straight. So she's not only calling to the foolish, but she's even calling to those who are trying to go on a straight path. Whoever is naive, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks understanding, she says, Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. So we've got two very different kinds of uh, concepts that are both made to be like people that are calling out and competing for a person to go one way or the other. And that's really what the book of Proverbs is all about, is two ways to live. Either live by gaining wisdom and, and obeying wisdom, or by ignoring wisdom and living according to folly. And again, one of the things that Proverbs says is that foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child. It's not like we're born wise and we get foolish over time. <coughs> we're born foolish 
And we have to grow in wisdom. So, <clears throat> the first nine chapters are very different from the rest of the book. The rest of the book are a collection of these wisdom sayings. And from chapter 10 to chapter 22, we have the Proverbs of Solomon. The, the first major group within that section contrasts the godly and the wicked. The second one contrasts, or encourages rather, godly lives. The next section are a group of anonymous sayings. We don't know who wrote these or, or phrased these. That runs from chapters 22 to 24. And these, perhaps this is true in your Bible. I know it is in the one I have. They're actually marked off at the beginning of each of these sections uh, as being Proverbs of Solomon, Proverbs uh, or anonymous wise sayings. Then we have Proverbs of Solomon that were copied by Hezekiah's men. He came almost 300 years later. That's further subdivided into Proverbs relating various relationships, regulating various relationships, and Proverbs that regulate various activities. We have the words of Augur in chapter 30 and the words of King Lemuel in chapter 31. His words are especially for leaders, for kings of that day. And, also, and of course we have the excellent wife that closes out the book in verses 10 through 31 of chapter 31. So that just gives you a, a broad overview of how the book is set up. First nine chapters are motivation to get and live by wisdom. The rest of the chapters are largely these short sayings that uh, contrast wisdom versus foolishness, ungodliness versus wickedness, and just the right way to do things according to God's design. So having said that, what are the major themes that we see in the book of Proverbs. Wisdom itself is, is the, the dominant theme in chapters one through nine. What else? Folly. Folly would be the one that it's contrasted with. How to conduct business. How to conduct business. Business transactions, being fair and equitable in those. Honesty and justice. What else? Dealings with brothers. There's really dealings with all kinds of different relationships uh, that are spelled out in the book of Proverbs. Friendships. Uh, dealings with the king. What's the beginning of wisdom? Fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. And a couple of different times in Proverbs it says, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. That's some of that parallelism that we talked about when we first started talking about the wisdom literature. Sovereignty of God. God's sovereignty and his judgment are a major theme in Proverbs. Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. That's a, that's a clear statement on the sovereignty of God, I think, as exists in all the Bible. We don't see how God does that all the time. We have some examples in Scripture. For example, God stirred up the heart of King Cyrus to issue a decree to allow Israel to go back to their land and rebuild their temple. He was working through, uh, we don't know if Cyrus was a believer or an unbeliever at that point, but that doesn't matter. God can still use uh, his influence to make the king do, do what he wants him to do. Proverbs 21.2 says, Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. And the idea there is God's judgment. Uh, we, see, we, tend to, we tend to uh, rationalize our own judgment, our own behavior, but God is ultimately the judge that will judge all of us. We talked about the fear of the Lord. Wisdom versus foolishness, godly versus wicked behavior. Pride versus humility is a significant contrast in Proverbs. Proverbs 29, 23 a man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. That matches up with what we looked at this morning in the book of Philippians, how humility, having a right attitude about yourself that's really driven by fear of the Lord and wanting to uh, obey God's commands in our attitudes and actions towards other people, humility is an important part of that. Speech is something that the book of Proverbs has an awful lot to say about. I, most of the time it seems to me that it's warning against 
talking too much uh, and how that can lead to sin. In fact, Proverbs 10.19 says, When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. What are some of your favorite Proverbs? Um, <clears throat> Do any of you have ones that you've memorized or that you think about as, as favorites? I like Proverbs 25, 11. Like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. So that's another one relating to speech and saying the right thing at the right time. Do you have one? Okay. Anybody else? Willow? One that... I don't remember what verse it is, but it says, my son eat honey fruit is sweet. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Say that. I didn't it get It says, my son eat honey fruit is sweet. Okay. Like apple fruit. Or something like that. No, that was, there was a, a riddle yeah, like that. But it's in the Proverbs? Yeah. Okay. Is uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. For in all your ways acknowledge him and him make your path straight. Isn't that Proverbs? It is. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, I think it is. I think that is right. But that's a great uh, kind of a summary, really, of what the message of Proverbs is all about, is seeking Him, seeking His wisdom. Uh, another one that, that was related to that, man plan, plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Mm -hmm. So, again, that's even recognizing the sovereignty of God and the way that He guides us. We walk by faith. God doesn't... You know, God doesn't appear to us and say, here's what you need to do in this situation. The way he's designed it is he's given us his word. We seek out the wisdom of his word. We seek to obey the principles that are in his word. And he guides our steps. Now, there's going to be times where even as we do that, there's going to be difficulty. And there's going to be trial. We see that in Paul's life as we're looking at Philippians. We see it in the life of Job. But God still... You know, God tests us sometimes. He wants us to put into things, put into practice the things that He's taught us in His Word, and that's what we're responsible to do. Anybody else? I was like um, the one about the first person to state your case sounds right until somebody else comes along to not make quick judgments until you've heard both sides of the story. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, again, some of that has to do with restraint to listening well um, before you respond. Okay. Raise up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from. Him. That's right. So of course, I struggle with that one. Yeah. Because we have adult sons that haven't necessarily walked with the Lord. And there's actually there's differences of interpretation as to exactly what that verse is talking about. Some people tend to to, to understand it as you know you kind of recognize the way that your child is bent or wired and you raise them up in such a way as to um, I mean obviously you, you raise them in the fear of the Lord but you also try to guide them in a way that the, the, that the Lord has gifted them and that they will flourish in that that they will do well in that down the road uh, Proverbs does speak about raising children the importance of discipline and there's a lot in there it's the best source to go to initially but as we said there's exceptions. You know, these aren't ironclad promises. You can do everything that you're responsible to do as a parent. The Lord has to be the one to save them, ultimately. And, you know, we do what we're responsible to do. Um, and they, these aren't necessarily ironclad promises that if you, if you do this, this, and this, or even if you do everything that's in the book of Proverbs, that your children will automatically come out right. Obviously, that happens a lot of times but it doesn't necessarily happen every time, just in the same way that other Proverbs are not. <clears throat> so they're truisms. They're truisms. They're, they're the way things generally work. And, and the Scripture makes it clear that there are exceptions to that. Okay, some other themes. Diligence in work. Bev, I think you mentioned that, or that was related to the proverb that you mentioned uh, outside of Scripture. Self-control. Let me read you one that speaks of self-control. Well, let me read one that talks about diligence. Poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Now again, there's exceptions to that. You know, I think obviously 
we, we honor the Lord by the way that we do our work. Now, does that mean that everybody who's a Christian who works hard is necessarily going to be wealthy? No, it doesn't mean that. But it, the Bible encourages us to work hard, to be good stewards of the things that God has entrusted us with. And certainly it warns against sloth, against not working hard. Solomon points us to the ant. Go to the ant, O sluggard. That would be somebody who's, who does sleep late and doesn't get the worm in the morning and doesn't work. Observe her ways, the way of the ant, and be wise, which, having no chief, officer, or ruler, pre prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. So even the ant, uh, the way that God has made that ant, uh, works hard, prepares food, so in the wintertime he has something to eat. Self-control, he who restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Finances is another theme that we see a lot of in the book of Proverbs. And I think a good summary of the way that Proverbs looks at money, it talks a lot about prospering as you work hard, about living within your means so that you don't consume everything that you've earned or made. This is the right balance, I think, in Proverbs chapter 30. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion. And here's, here's the warnings against the two extremes of poverty or riches. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? That's what happens when you multiply silver, like Solomon did. We have a tendency that when we grow prosperous, we, we forget where that prosperity comes from. And we don't depend on the Lord the same way. As James says, that God has made the poor man rich in faith. There's a sense in which a poor person has to depend upon the Lord more, or is more cognizant of it. So that's the warning on the one hand. Lest I be, if I'm rich, lest I be full deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or, lest I be in want and still. Now he's looking at the other end of the extreme, and that's poverty. There's no inherent virtue in being dirt poor. Um, he says, lest I be in want and still and profane the name of my God. So what he's really saying is, Lord, give me my daily bread. I'll trust you, I'll work, I'll do what I'm responsible to do. Just give me what I need to satisfy you know, my daily needs. Give me this day my daily bread. Another verse on Proverbs, or sorry, another proverb on wealth or finances. There's precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man swallows it up. That goes back to what I was talking about earlier, the idea of if you live beyond your means, if you spend more than you make, that's going to lead to difficulty. A wise man doesn't do that. And then we have Proverbs on all these different relationships. Kings, wives. We've spoken about child rearing, neighbors, friends. Um, let me just read a couple of these. As far as wives, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. That's uh, the good thing side of finding a good wife. Proverbs has a lot to say about that. The negative side is it's better to live in a corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Now, you, you think about Solomon in particular as somebody who had a bunch of wives. Uh, I guess he should know better than anybody. But um, it, the emphasis here is especially on men finding a good wife. He who finds a good wife finds a good thing. Uh, and just realizing the importance of that decision. Disciplining children, do not hold back discipline from the child. Although you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from Sheol. Now, none of, none of us enjoys making our children cry, and it's not an, always an easy thing to discipline your child the way that you need to, but you're doing it for their long-term good, and that's what you have to keep in mind. Friends, he who blesses his friend with a loud voice early in the morning, it will be reckoned a curse to him. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, 
just recognizing that there's times where you say the right thing at the right time. Um, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Do not contend with a man without a cause. If he has done you no harm. So there's just a lot in there as far as relationships and the way that you have good friendships. Uh, another one that I like is um, he who walks with the wise will be wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. So that has to do with how you know who you associate with, who you spend the most time with, and the way that they influence you over time. <clears throat> All right, I think this is the last slide. Uh, we have here what's called the Fool family, and all three members are mentioned in this one verse in Proverbs 122. How long, O oh naive ones, will you love simplicity, and scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate knowledge? So there's levels of foolishness within the book of Proverbs that these three terms describe. The naive or simpleton is one who is easily enticed and misled. He believes everything, including bad counsel. He lacks moral prudence. He needs discernment. He's capable of learning. Now, there's still hope for the naive, and you remember that's the group of people that the wise, the Lady Wisdom, is calling out to. This is the wide-eyed youth who's headed for trouble unless he listens to the counsel of wisdom, unless he gets wisdom. So this is the, the one that has the most hope. A fool is a moral and spiritual dullard. And again, it's not an intellectual issue. It's not that he's not smart or that he can't learn, but it's his attitude towards wisdom. He doesn't appreciate wisdom. He doesn't appreciate rebuke or correction. And he ends up just becoming more foolish because of that. The scoffer is the bottom of the barrel. He's cynical and defiant. He's a free thinker who ridicules the righteous and everything for which he stands. I always think of here a, a university professor, perhaps, who uh, is not only <clears throat> doesn't fear the Lord, but really tries to ridicule anybody that, that does do that or tries to, anybody who tries to speak from the scriptures and authority. And then we see again another verse that just talks about the responses of each one of these groups uh, to wisdom and to receiving wisdom, strike a scoffer. And it's interesting. There's a number of Proverbs that talk about uh, dealing with fools and scoffers and dealing with them in, in such a way that you strike them, you hit them in the mouth. Uh, the back of fools are prepared for blows, it says. And the, I think the, the main point of that is that they don't receive wisdom. They don't receive verbal instruction. So here he says, strike a scoffer and the naive may become shrewd. The scoffer himself is not going to appreciate being struck. He's not going to change because of that. But the naive person looking on can grow from understanding why a, a scoffer is struck the way he was. But reprove one who has understanding, and he will gain knowledge. A lot of Proverbs is just talking about the attitude and reception of wisdom, of being able to receive instruction and growing in that. <clears throat> All right, purpose statement, Proverbs is a collection of wisdom teaching that is a collection of wisdom teaching that is given as exhortation and instruction to the naive young man so that he might walk in wisdom. As we said, is pur the purpose of the book is spelled out very clearly in the first seven verses. All right, next week we'll look at the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a different kind of wisdom literature. It contains some Proverbs within it, but it's really one long message where Solomon's asking this question, what profit is there under the sun for man and all in his activity? He's really asking kind of the question of what is the meaning of life? And he launches his own personal investigation to try to answer that question. And then he, he gives a very long answer uh, with some different refrains along the way. And then he reaches an ultimate conclusion at the end. And we'll look at that next week. Any questions about anything else in Proverbs in particular? Okay. Let me pray for us and we'll be dismissed. 
Father, we thank you for the wisdom that you've revealed to us and the way that you've made it even interesting for us to, to read and easier for us to memorize. And Lord, we pray that, and we recognize that wisdom is not just knowing the right things to do, but actually doing it. In fact, it's foolishness to know what's right and, and not put it into practice. Help us to do that. Help us to just to glean all that we can from the instruction in the book of Proverbs especially and to put that into practice as we walk day by day in Christ, as we fear you and him, and as we seek to honor you in the way that we conduct our lives and walk in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. Thank you for the opportunity that we've had to worship this morning together. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.